Uh, hi. How y'all doing? Good. 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 Do you notice I'm wearing a short sleeve shirt? That means warmer weather's coming. <laughs> it's right around the corner, folks. It's time to get excited. Uh, this is really what it's all about, getting ahead of Aurora. If ha, Anybody new? Brand new? A couple of you? Good. You got to get ahead of Varroa. <laughs> I, I mean, this is really what beekeeping has become about. I, and listen, like the rest of you, we're sick of this, right? We're sick of having to talk about this. But we're going to talk about some different tactics to try this year. And uh, I'll take you through a year in the life of the apiary as far as Varroa goes. And I'll give you uh, a possible path to taking care of your Varroa. So how many have lost hives? Show of hands. Yeah, me too. You know what you lost them to? Varroa, right? And I'll go through some reasons why that's true and what we're gonna do to advance our understanding and approach. So, not worried about that. Let's talk about why we treat. Let's talk about the four factors to consider on your choice of what treatment you're gonna do. We'll talk about the timing of when you do things. There are constraints to certain tactics and, and choices. I'll give you the physical year an example, January, February, March, April, May. And then uh, I'll leave you some, some final words of wisdom. So I know <laughs> nobody wants to treat. I don't want to treat, I hate it. If I, if I could be like Grizzly Adams and live out in the middle of the Ozarks and not have to treat, I, I would be thrilled to death. But you live in New Jersey. And all of these folks sitting around you are within connection points to each other here in New Jersey. On my street, within the three mile flying distance, there are six beekeepers. And those six beekeepers are within three miles of someone else who are within three miles. And just about all of New Jersey is connected. There's a few pockets, but your neighbor's problems are your problems and vice versa. So it's really important that we all pay attention to this in New Jersey. Now, if you live in Pennsylvania, if you live in Illinois, if you live in different places where there is no agriculture, there is no, um, what do we have in New Jersey? Blueberries. What does that mean? Part of our problem is the commercial crops go right, or the commercial trucks go right through our corridor on 95. So we're, we're in, uh, we're like the East Coast equivalent of almond orchards, as far as I'm concerned to this. And those who do not treat lose mites, or lose hives. That's the answer. State Apers will tell you over and over again now there are those who do not treat New Jersey and do okay, but again, I would say there are certain circumstances that allow that to be, but as a general principle, we're gonna go the safe route and tell you you should follow the guidance that we're gonna give you here today. And for those who think that, well, I'll just train my bees, I'll start with a package, I'll bring in the right genetics, you're too small, and you're too mixed with everybody else's bees. And just like you can't train a dog to drive, you're not gonna train the mites in a short period of time, or the bees to deal with mites. So one of the things to think about that, that's a Megan Milbrath kind of concept, is you should buy good bees if you're getting started. You should try and find genetic stock. You should try and buy local bees if you can. You're better to do that than if you buy them from California or Georgia or whatever. There are people here in New Jersey who are selling bees that have been acclim acclimatized, is there a word? Uh, to New Jersey. So buy local if you could do it. There's a lot of things that bother hives, cause problems. People lose hives to yellow jackets. That's why we're gonna cover that a little later. But bar none, Varroa is the biggest problem. And for them to 
for the bees to deal with this, you have to have a treatment strategy. And part of the treatment strategy is you have to monitor. There's a lot of different approaches to monitor. Take samples, check and see your thresholds, and determine whether or not you have uh, problems. So part of the situation here is start with good bees, follow the right plan, and monitor. Okay. When a bee is impacted by a mite, it simply doesn't live as long. The mite attacks the bee, it vectors a virus, and the bee is 20 to 70 percent impacted on its lifespan and its ability to do its activity. And when they have viruses, they're more susceptible to things like nosema and other problems. So, do you have mites in your hives? Absolutely. Even coming out of winter, you have them in there. So these problems are there. Your populations are going to be smaller. If the mites overwhelm your hive, your hive's going to abscond. If you had a mite load going into winter, you probably made it to about January and then you found this little tiny cluster with a lot of dead bees on the bottom. It's mites. It's mites. Got a problem in the back? <laughs> ah. Okay. So there's choices. And I know this is an eye chart. And that's kind of on purpose. There's one thing that I will tell you is when you want to do your mite treatments, you have to know the product that you're using. And I'm not going to tell you what it is. Because the first thing I will always tell you is read the instructions. And as often as I've used Apivar, Apigard, any of the other treatments, the first thing I do before I walk out in the yard and light the smoker is I pull down the instructions and I read them again. So you can see your choices here. You have Apivar, Apigard, Apolifevar, Mitoway Quick Strips, Oxalic Acid. Mitoway Quick Strips has two formulations, the original and a new one called Formic Pro. I would recommend you use the new one. You can see how effective they are. Apivar, 99% effective. So a lot of people really like that. It's easy to use but you can't use it only by itself. You have to use it with other things. If I put Apivar in and it kills specific mites in a hive, it only kills the mites that are impacted by Apivar. The ones that do not die keep breeding. And if I don't use something to get the ones that survived, I'm building super mites. And we do not want a tolerance. So we'll talk about some instructions in here that you should follow, not only with Apivar, but with everything else. So thank you to Landy Simone. This is her chart. There's one other page. Oxalic acid dribble, oxalic acid vaporization. This is the new Darling. There used to be HopGuard. There's a new product, HopGuard 2. By the way, I should tell you that this video that we're making will be up on our YouTube channel and we'll make the deck available if you want to send an email to our NWNJBA uh, for our members. So you can see there's a bunch of different options. That's really why these two slides are in here. Okay, and that's going to become important. When you're doing your treatments, timing, protecting your food source, making sure that the temperature is correct, and figuring out what your bees are doing are the four factors that you have to consider. And we'll go through these a little more detail, but let me just hit on them. Timing is about what product to use at what time period. I'm wearing a short sleeve shirt. I joke that it's getting warmer, but a week ago it was 30 degrees as a high. What are the bees doing in a hive at 30 degrees? They're on a cluster. So if you tried to treat on a cluster, 
you may not be able to penetrate the cluster. Let's say you do a vaporization treatment. The bees on the outside will get it, but the bees on the inside won't. Let's say you put apivar in there. Will they get the contact to all the apivar? Maybe they will, maybe they won't. So the timing of what the bees are doing and what's going on in the world uh, matters. And it also matters when you talk about your products, uh, there's certain instructions that you have to follow that give you a different aspect of timing. Honey protection, of course, you don't want to taint your honey. Temperature, we'll go into more of that, but these products require you to read the instructions and understand. And make no mistake about it, if you get it wrong, you're going to kill your colony or you're going to impact it at a time you don't want to. So think about the way the year goes. March to April 15th, your hives can be open on warmer days. Bees are on the cluster. Some days they'll get some flying days or they'll open up and they'll be able to move around and get some honey. Okay, think about what's going on inside the hive. April through July, in New Jersey, you have an active honey flow. A lot of good things happen in April to July. Strong bees, new bees, Lots of bees, lots of resources, lots of nutrition. And oh, by the way, you're growing a lot of mites in that time period. July 15th to August 31st, that's when things dry up around here. You get to the dearth, is what it's referred to, when the nectar flow falls off. What do the queens do during the dearth when less food is coming in? Their natural reaction is to slow down. Less food, stop laying eggs. That's important to know, and we're gonna talk about why. September 1st to October 15th, depending on where you are, you may or may not, New Jersey, get a nectar flow again with asters and goldenrod. And then November 30th time frame, you start to close things down. And we start all over again. So each of these periods has a specific thing going on that impacts what you can and can't do. Let's break them down. I want to use an example. How many have ever used Apigard? Only a small handful. Okay, so Apigard, Apigard is a thymol gel. Not a bad product to use. Makes a good alternative. Pretty simple, pull the thing off, put the tray in, use it for a couple weeks, pull it out, put the other tray in, use it for a couple weeks, you're done. Okay, but there are some instructions that you have to follow. You have to use a spacer. You have to follow the temperature guides. What happens if it's too hot? This stuff will gas your hives. It will gas your hives. It's a time old gel and it's going to evaporate and it's going to impact your hive. Your hive will be hanging out on the front porch. All the brood that can't get out could get destroyed. It may damage your queen. You really have to pay attention when you use these products to follow the instructions and I would say on some of them be conservative. And the purpose of being conservative is that it tells you you could use this in 85 degrees but I wouldn't. Be very careful about really hot temperature on anything that is volatile like this. So you apply it in the afternoon. You obviously close your screen bottom board. You don't want the product going out. Most of the time what happens with this is you put it in, the bees walk through and distribute it out through the hive. That's how it works. Sometimes it sublimates, which means it evaporates inside. Can use a half dose if it's too hot. And again, it's not my will to explain to you how to use Apigard, it's to make you understand that you have to follow the instructions because if you use it wrong, you can do harm and we don't want to do any harm. But we also need it to be effective. So what's the starting range above 60 degrees? Could you have used it in February? Probably not. It's been too cold. So temperature matters in this case. 
Okay, and there's things like sometimes you don't feed bees while you're doing treatments and so on. These folks who make this stuff, they know. Nod Apiaries, for example, makes a couple of these products. Go read their instructions. Read their instructions. Don't follow what you find on the internet because people get really crazy about things they say. So Apicard might taint your honey. So you have to remove your supers. You don't want it to taste like thymol gel, do you? It may also taint your comb. So if you pull your honey supers off, wax absorbs these flavors. You don't want that in your wax for your honey supers when you're doing extraction. It'll give a funny off taste to your honey. Okay? I think I've beaten the instruction too read and follow the instructions. So there are timing considerations. Apigard, it takes four weeks to apply it. That's four weeks where you can't be in the middle of honey flow. Right? We just talked about that. In order to use Apivar and Apolifevar, there are instructions. How long do you use Apivar? Anybody? 42 days. Yeah? Up to 54. Up to 56 days. Okay? That's important. I'll talk about that in a second. But these are some of the things. Now, are you going to remember that? No, you're going to read the instructions. Okay? But you have to plan for these windows of opportunity when you're going to do things. Okay? It's really important. Protect your honey. By the way, quick strips, HopGuard 2 are the only two things you could put in your product in your hive. Everything else you cannot do with honey supers on. Again, read the instructions for your products. Don't mess this up. <laughs> yeah. The instructions you're talking about line straw hive. I'm talking about the manufacturer product instructions for the stuff you would put in your hive. I don't have honey supers. I have a horizontal hive. Yeah, so if, if you're going to do that, then you're going to pull your honey frames out and store them somewhere while you're doing your treatments. And in your case, for a horizontal hive, you might do what I have here, is a separate little box with a nuke and put them in the nuke for a period of time, store them while you're doing your treatments and then put the stuff back in your hive. And you could put a follower board in the middle to, you know, contract the hive while you're doing your treatment. Okay. Yeah, there's a couple products that you can use. So you sometimes when you get yourself in a jam or you plan your specific yearly uh, program, you go, okay, I know that I want to treat and it's going to be during the flow. And during the flow, I have two options. And I want to switch my products from this product to that product so I kill the mites that the other one didn't kill. And I'm only going to be able to use Max, Formic Pro, same thing or hop guard, right? So you have to think about if your treatment regime calls for you to treat when the honey flow is on, what are you gonna do? Several of these products, I'm gonna say it again, will nuke your hives if you do them at the wrong temperatures. When Mighty Way Quick Strips first came out, people put them in and that's, this is why there's, uh, I'm gonna make a statement not on behalf of the manufacturer, but on behalf of beekeepers' experience. By the way, quick strips, the formulation seemed wrong. <coughs> Max. The new Formic one doesn't seem as strong. When people first put by the way, quick strips in, they got great kills, but they also killed their hives a lot of times. Almost everybody reported that hives absconded out or were hanging off the front and it killed a lot of brood and it damaged queens and people literally lost hives with Max. One of the key things, this is a key product, you have to make sure you don't put it in hot temperatures. So a recommendation for Midaway Quick Strips, for example, is to take the product, put it in the refrigerator or freezer, get it cold, put it in in the evening when it's cooler and let it go overnight into morning 
and that way it doesn't go in in the morning it gets 90 degrees during the day and the thing just absolutely gasses the hive because it was so hot and that product will tell you to add a separate box for the fumes to collect and things like that so again you want to follow that but beekeepers have been making that product cold now the way that the industry responded was we'll use less of it so they came back and said you could use one instead of two pads and ideas like that most of the time most of the time when you use a product put what is supposed to go in by the instructions if they tell you for example on Apivar to put two strips for every five frames two in a box of 10 frames do that don't put one put two use the use the product instruction now mighty way quick strips they actually do tell you and so does apigard that you could use smaller variants of the product okay so again i i don't know all these rules i go read the instructions and i figure out what i want to do hives grow they maintain steady steep they go down and they get on the cluster that's how things work right now they're on the cluster Pretty soon they'll start to grow. They'll maintain steady state during, you know, forage, almost summertime. The dearth will come, they'll go down. Maybe they'll build their winter bees and then they'll go back down and they'll go back to the cluster. When you treat, is the hive broodless? Is the hive um, full of brood? And you can't get the mites underneath uh, cappings. So there's a lot of new folks in. Let's talk about that. Where do mites hang out? They hang out sometimes on the bees. That's called phoretic mites. They go on the underside in between the, the plates. So you generally don't see them on the back of the bee. If you're looking at bees, it's hard to find them. Sometimes they're on the top, but most of the time they're not. But where do they really hang out? They go inside the cells just before they're capped and they're in the cells. So if you're treating with something that treats the mites hanging on the bees and you're thinking you're getting the ones inside, unless you're using Mitaway Quick Strips, which is a product or Formic Pro that does penetrate into the cells and kill the mites in the cells, you're not doing an effective treatment. So what do you do with certain products? You wait until they're broodless. You create a brood break. You take a cage that Bob Kloss is going to show you later and you put it over top of the queen and you keep her from laying eggs and you hatch all the eggs out inside so there's no capped brood and then you do your treatment and all the mites are exposed to whatever your treatment is. <coughs> so you have to understand that hives grow, maintain steady steep and what is going on inside your hive and how effective will your treatment be at the time that you apply it. Has so everybody got that? Anybody confused? It makes sense, right? So you need to have bees moving around. If I put Apigard in, going back to our benchmark example, Apigard, in today, and the bees were on a cluster, they're not moving around. So they won't track through the gel, so they won't be transmitting it in the hive. Okay? There's another thing about Apigard that's kind of funny. You put it in, and if in the first two days, you open it up and the tray is empty. Do you put the next one in right away? No. You wait the full two weeks and then you put the second one in. And on the second one, what if they don't track it all out? You take whatever is left after the two week period and you smear it inside the hive and you take the tray out. So again, there, there are some instructions in this that you have to follow, but if the bees are on the cluster and they're not moving around and they're not getting the product and distributing it, it's not going to work. So what's going on inside your hive matters. Do you treat nukes and packages? First thing is you don't want to over treat. So ask your provider when you're getting a package, was it treated? Hopefully the answer was yes, that they checked the thresholds. Common wisdom used to be no. First year you would put your nuke in, you would put your package in when I started beekeeping and the thresholds would never get beyond for that hive 
and you'd be good to go. I literally remember standing in front of an audience like this recommending, you don't have to treat your first year peas. Days are gone. <laughs> got to do it now. What you got to do is monitor your bees and see if they're over the threshold and treat them as required. Okay? Some people will tell you that the best time to treat is when you put a package in because what are they? Broodless. So you're getting all the mites off and you're giving me a good healthy start. You know that when you put that package in the box and you treat them for mites and they have a very low threshold or no mites, they will get off to a really good start in their first year. And one of the things that's a detractor to uh, you know, a colony is if they're sick. Right? So the healthier bees are better off. So yeah, you're going to have to monitor and treat. Now if you buy packages from certain providers, sometimes you'll open up the nuke box and there'll be Apivar in it. Right? They've already treated. You do want to know what they treated with so that you don't treat with the exact same thing second time around. So do ask your provider if you're buying bees what, what they did for a mite treatment regime. Okay, this question always comes up, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to head it off. Why don't I just treat? Just do it prophylactically. We don't really recommend that. What we want to do in the world is get bees to the point where they can live with mites. They probably never get rid of them, but if at some point they could come to some sort of balance, more in the favor of the bees on our part, hopefully, we're good to go. If you're just treating prophylactically, that doesn't make sense. What we recommend is you monitor, get to a threshold, and if you hit that threshold, treat. Now, there's an odd concept in this is that most of us, once you get beyond a couple hives, don't have the time to monitor every single hive. If you do, good. If you don't, monitor a couple, and if you find mites in some of them, treat the rest of them. Here's the thing. If there's mites in this hive, there's going to be mites in that hive because bees drift. So if you're treating this one and you don't treat that one, it's going to come back full circle. Or vice versa. Okay? So do a representative sample of the mites or of the mites thresholds in your yard and you know, check your hives and as soon as you find a couple, treat them all. You got to have a plan. And we're going to give you an example. Every year varies. The weather varies. Food sources vary. We don't know yet. We could have a fully wet, rainy spring, which is going to change what you do. So what you want to do is you've got to have a plan, and you've got to have a contingency plan. You've got to know that I'm going in with this plan, but if something changes along the way, what am I going to do as a backup? And knowing your options, Going back to that chart that we showed earlier, knowing your options is helpful. I intended to treat early this year. I bought Apivar. I was going to treat in March. I wanted my bees, as they were brood enough, to be mite free. I stood out in my yard with packages and it was too cold and I chickened out. I didn't want to open the hives. Because as soon as it gets cold and you crack the hives and you break all the propolis and whatever, you're going to impact your bees. I thought better of it. Now I'm on plan B, which is I'm thinking Formic Pro. Because I'm going to Africa next week and I'll be gone. And by the time I get back, it'll be warmer and I want a tree. And I'm going to have brood. So you could think, I'm already thinking, right? And you should be too. What are you going to do with this? So you've got to have a plan. And what I would say to you is build the plan now and try and follow it, but adjust it accordingly as required, okay? Because beekeeping is local. And, you know, what's funny is I talked to folks last year driving up to somebody's house to help them with bees. I went up north through Clinton, and as soon as I got up to Glen Garden, I was like, oh, <laughs> oh, it was yellow as could be, beautiful. Golden rod everywhere. We didn't have that down in Ringo's, where I'm from. We didn't have that. So even in Hunterdon County and up through Warren, it changes. Beekeeping is local. You have to look at what's going on and put your plan together. 
This got me last year. Made the mistake. Duh. Once you tear that package from the factory, your ticker is clicking. Tick, 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 tick. You cannot take, and this is a problem, is they sell 10 packs, you have two hives, you use a couple and go, I'll save the rest for later. No. Find a friend and say, does anybody else need Abivar? I'm gonna crack a package open, okay? Do not put it in Ziploc and think it's gonna work. It doesn't. It's vacuum sealed in there, and it's like a dog collar. That's what I want you to think about. As soon as you open it and it's exposed to the air, the product comes out through the plastic for a period of time until it's expired. And a dog collar only lasts so long, a flea and tick collar, it's, it's very similar to this, and you throw them out, right? And they'll tell you the same thing on those packages. Once you open them, you're done. So please, if you leave today, remember this. Do not ever think that you're doing good treatments with Apivar packages that are open. Okay, let's go through a year. What happens in January? February? Cold, bees are on the cluster. Bad idea, open your hives. Lainey, Lainey Simone did this kind of talk. So again, I'll give credit to her. This, the, the backbone of this talk comes from Landy's. She don't open until her hives till March, is what I remember her saying. You might get a warm day here and there. Check to see if they're flying. Make sure they got enough food. If you crack it open, you might stick a couple apovars in there very quickly. But I wouldn't be breaking boxes apart, looking through frames and so on. We did get one really warm day. Crazy. What was it this week? It was 75. Even then, I still wouldn't do it, because what was it the next day? March. Warmer days, bees flying, pollen coming in. Woohoo! What we see when we look at our brood minders is March 1st is magic day. That's generally when you see the hive start to maintain that steady state of 90 something degrees and they're building brood, that's what they're doing. So in here, you can start saying, well, March 1st, I am going to start having cap brood in my hive. So if I do a treatment, I'm not getting a cap brood unless I use mine away quick strips or Formic Pro, okay? I want you to think about that. Is it bad to do a treatment then and kill the phoretic mites? No, not at all. Just know that you're not getting everybody, okay? So you could use Apivar. Contact is possible, it's not a bad choice. A lot of people like Apivar, easy, no muss, no fuss, in and out. I put a second choice on here. I didn't intend to do that, but I did it for one reason. How many went in the fall and used Apivar? A lot. So you need to figure out what you're gonna do in the spring if Apivar was your last treatment because you gotta switch it up. Okay, so maybe you try Mite Away Quick Strips or Formic. They keep putting Max, everybody think Formic. <laughs> Formic's the new product, you should use the new one, not the old one, okay? But especially in the later part of the month, because it has to be warm enough for Formic to work. So on these days where it's 40 degrees on a high, it's not in the product range. So you're looking later in March time frame, okay? Other things you could use, HopGuard, Apolite Var, oxalic acid, you could use any time. A lot of people do oxalic acid vaporizations this time of year because you could just stick it in the entrance and away you go. If they get a warm day where it breaks a cluster, it will work. So again, you're gonna pick your first option and you're gonna go with it. I just put alternatives because maybe you used App of our last go round, okay? And maybe you don't know what oxalic is or you don't have it yet. We're gonna, we're gonna actually show you later, we have one here. So, HopGuard 2 is new. How many have ever used it? Two people, three, four, five, okay. Yeah, it looks messy, but it looks doable. March-ish, <laughs> you're gonna see some cleaning. What I wanted to say here is March-ish, meaning sometimes when it starts to get warm, 
above 60 degrees, do your first mite checks. Now, if you listen to Be Informed Partnership or the folks from Minnesota, they'll tell you there are some people who literally do mite checks every month. <coughs> Cold, warm, tepid, raining, doesn't matter, they do it. I don't know if that makes a lot of sense to me personally. But once it gets to a steady state where they're flying every day, you could do a quick mic check and see where your thresholds are. Okay? It's really an interesting idea to start the year and know where your thresholds are before you go into the honey flow. It's your benchmark that you can follow. Early to mid April, they're really burning. They're doing opportunistic foraging. They're out getting skunk cabbage and some of the early trees. They're getting ready for the real deal. They're very excited. You see a lot of fresh new bees at the entrance. Treatments that involve broodlessness as a part of effective will cease to be an opportunity. This is where you do have to switch to formic and max, right? Because you're going to have a lot of brood in the hive. And you're not going to get it when you treat. April 26. Why did I call this date out? So in the first example, going back to March 1st, that's when I said to do Apivar, right? The product is 42 to 56 days range. I beg you to use it all 56 days. The reason being is that you're going to get longer runs of mite gestation if you use it the full width and why would you not take advantage of that? So 56 days from March 1st is April 26. Now what I want you to know about that is what comes right after? Honey flow, right? So you can't do it earlier because it's cold, but you can't do it later because you're going to run into the honey flow and you got to get it off. Now there's a wait period after Apivar where you're supposed to wait to put your honey supers on. When you talk to the Apivar people, physically talk to them at a show, they'll tell you, we did that as a safety margin, but we're confident that you could probably pull the Apivar out and put supers on right away. I would tell you to do what? Follow the instructions. <laughs> and that means build your period, right? Why risk it? Why risk it? This is where you go on the internet. Now, I made that statement in public. This is going to get on, up on YouTube. And people are going to hear that. And they're going to go, Kevin said, I could just put my honey supers on. I'm saying follow the instructions. But you're going to read on the internet because a lot of people say this. You could do that. You do as you're going to do, uh, I follow the instructions, okay? Do post-treatment monitoring. We don't treat for the sake of treating prophylactically. We, we monitor, we treat, and we determine what the results are. There is some conversation about how effective Apivar is. Last year, if you listen to the scuttlebutt, some people say it wasn't as effective as in the past. Is that true or not? The only way you're going to know is to monitor, okay? How did it work for you in your yard? I implore you to follow the instructions and get it out of your hive. Don't leave it in there. That's what it says. Don't be lazy and go, ah, I'll be back in July. On April 26, when the 56 days are up, get it out, okay? And a reminder, fresh, unopened package, follow the instructions. <coughs> There's soft chemicals, there's hard chemicals, there's IPM, which stands for Integrated Pest Management. There are other things that you can do. Bees want to mate in spring, so they build a lot of drones. It is known that mites hide in drone comb. You can employ a strategy to put drone brood frames, which we'll show you a little later today, in your hive and cull them them meaning cut them out or freeze the frame put them back in and kill the mites that way it's an easy win for getting rid of mites no chemicals no anything now some will say 
What about the drones? So far, people who do this, they don't see any impact. You're probably okay losing those drones. Your neighbor's drones will fill in, okay? You could do splits. When you split a hive, half the mites go over there and half of them stay here. If your hive swarms, you got free mite control because half of them left and a new queen starts and she may not be laying right away and that's a brood break. Or you could do it the old fashioned way. Take a cage and confine the queen like we said earlier and create a brood break where she can only lay in a small area and let it all hatch out and then do a treatment and get rid of the mites. So there's, there's options here. During the nectar flow is the best time to look at these options for integrated pest management. Okay? Quick question. If you cage the queen, they don't try to make a new queen because she's like inaccessible? So when the queen's in the hive, the question is if you cage her, will they try to make a new queen? The queen keeps the hive together by queen substance. When you cage her, they can still feed her, take care of her, and more importantly, they still have contact with her and they're distributing her queen substance pheromone and it keeps everything together. So they should not have a difficulty with that. Okay, add your honey serpers May 1st through July 15th in New Jersey. May 1st, it's game on. Life is good. Again, you could use Mitoway Quick Strips or Formic Pro, but when you're using that, you can impact your bees. Now, one of the things people say about this is, once you've built your entire population to your honey flow, and they're out running their honey flow, and they've gotten towards the end of it, if you treat them and kill some bees, they've already collected everything they're gonna collect. So somewhere in this period, it's not a bad loss. And you get a head start on it. Most beekeepers will tell you just wait till the honey flow is over. And when they start to ramp down, that's when you do it. Okay? Pull your honey supers, what should you do? Check your levels. Okay? You're July 15th. Now, old wisdom was July, August, treat your bees. Most bee bee beekeepers procrastinated, wait till September. If you do that, your bees are going to die. This is an important milestone for us. Time and time again, when we look at swarm data and we look at nectar flow data, July 15th, the show is over. And you want to do a mite check. You want to do a mite check, I'm gonna tell you why, okay? You can consider other options now, but you have to be careful about heat in this time period. When you choose, if it's 80 degrees and you put something on that gasses your bees, you got a problem, okay? So this is really important at this time period to pay attention to those four factors, especially the temperature one. I have a question. Is it, is it reasonable to wait until after you've taken your honey off to use uh, mite away? Because um, my understanding is that uh, the vapors from Mite Away will distinctly uh, decrease your honey, the, the amount of honey that the bees store. So if you're... Increase or decrease? Decrease. Decrease. Okay, so you're... Stop it. Your thought is uh, if you treat with Formic or Max, when honey is on, it will slow them down. Yes. Wait till the honey's off. Sure, that's fine. The whole thing about Formic acid in the product is part of honey. That's why you can treat. It just adds a little formic more to the honey. It's not a detriment to its taste or problem. So sure, you could wait till the honey's off if you want to do it and, um, and treat with them. Right? But you've got to worry about temperature. The ones that really make me nervous are, are these products. I don't know about formic, but I know, I know dozens I'm not kidding. Dozens of beekeepers who had problems with my way quick strips. So this is the curve. I want you to think about the way the world works. Life is good from 
Nectar flow start to J July 15th, nectar flow in. Queen's cranking in there, she's laying 1,500 eggs. They've got huge populations, every frame's covered with bees, everybody's singing happy songs. And all of a sudden, somebody turns the grocery store off and the bees go like this, right? Queen gets sense that there's no more food coming in, no more pollen coming in, less water available because it's dried up, summer dearth is here, and she starts knocking down. All the, all the brood is emerging, all the mites are coming out, they're on the bees, and the population is going down, but the mites are still breeding. So bees go up and they start to come down, and mites follow that curve up, up, up. When bees go down, mites are still going up, and then eventually they come down. That's what this demonstrates. So you see the up of the bees, and you see the up of the mites. Well, what happens over there in July and August? Your hive is completely and utterly infested with mites. So a good time is to treat in early July. Don't let them be infested. When that, when that curve starts going down, it's a good period to think about your treatments. And we used to say July and August, and a lot of beekeepers waited till the end of the summer, and oh, school's gonna start, and problems, and, and then they treat in September, and their hives all died. And July, we're going on vacation, you know, we're doing all that stuff. Kids are getting off from school. Sorry, folks. It doesn't work that way anymore. You have to be out there in mid-July doing a mite check and treating your hives if they require it. It's so important. So summer is where mites overwhelm hives. The bees contract after the flow tapers off, but the mites go up and overwhelm. You'll start seeing deformed wing virus. You'll see bees vibrating at the entrance, having seizures, whatever the case may be. And what you do in July and early August has a profound impact on whether you're a beekeeper the next year. Can't be any more simple than saying it that way. Every one of you raise your hands about hives being lost. Tell me if you followed this. Did anybody treat in July? There's other reasons, but no. I, I mean, th this, is, this is so important. So it's a turning point for hive survival. This is what's new for us. Now, mind you, I've told you already, consider treating in March to get the mites down, because this is an aspect, I want to go back a slide. See how low the mites are. This is Randy's. Randy treats all year long. If you don't treat, the mites go boom quicker in the spring. The mite load is higher through the flow. And then when the dearth comes, you have more mites than what Randy's representing here. Randy treats, Randy Oliver, treats all year long, right? When he needs to, he's in California. But we, the beekeepers, never used to treat in March in New Jersey. We'd wait till July. If you knock the mites down in March, when you get to July, your thresholds won't be as bad and you won't be overwhelmed. Some hives are literally overwhelmed by July in New Jersey. Yeah? I think it goes back to when you're treating and you have to worry about the uh, treatments um, turning to vapor when it becomes really hot. So say you're treating and you're using the um, after bar for a 56 day period and you have one of those days that pop up in the middle of your treatment to that is a 93 day. Yeah, so the question is if you're treating with Apivar and you're in that 56 day window and you get a really hot day, what do you do with that? Apivar is a contact. Okay, so. So it's well, not a heat one. one. But if you're treating with some of the others, so let's talk about Formic. The way that product works, I'm not a chemist, but I'll play one on TV. We have several in the audience who will correct me if I get this wrong. You put the product in. And within the first short period of its duration, it gasses off most of its uh, product. And then it's a very low dose until it finishes. So as long as you plan, I'm going to treat on a Tuesday. And from Tuesday to Friday, I'm looking, I'm not going to see an 80 degree day. I should be okay. Now on Friday, if they're calling for 80 and sunny, maybe I want to think about it, but I shouldn't be as nervous.
So these temperature sensitive things, usually two, three days window, if you can keep the, the temps down, you should be okay. So that's the question. When you have a temperature sensitive, should you worry about the duration? The answer is yes, you should worry, but you should try to look at the very near period to when you put it in. Yeah, Jim. If it's a rainy week, it probably won't get that hot, and uh, you can go ahead and put it in. But I have put it in when it was hot, and uh, they don't like it at all. They don't like it, yeah. I mean, you can get by, but they had a question over here. Yeah. yeah I was going to just say what Jim said. Um, pick your weather app of choice, the one you think is most reliable, and a lot of them go two weeks out. And I use that as a guide, particularly with forming on when to start. If there's a three day period early on, it's out of range, you gotta wait. I subscribe to Weather Underground and there's a person with a weather station literally on the corner. If I peek out my house, I could see the thing spinning. <laughs> so look on Weather Upground, well, Underground, you can get a local, yeah. You keep saying trees down. I checked my light things like weekly last year. But, yeah. And they were all okay, they were like one or two. So I really shouldn't be treating them. You should not be treating. If you're below the threshold, you should yeah. not be treating. Are you checking? Uh, sugaring. Yeah, that's not as accurate. Okay. Yeah, so the conversation going on is sugar roll is how you're doing your yeah. checks. There is a certain fudge factor on sugar roll because let's let's just take a quick sidebar on this. Okay. If you're doing an alcohol wash, the the accuracy of that is proven to be pretty effective. Okay. If you do a sugar roll, some days you're going to get as close. I've seen people do a head-to-head -head comparison and it's good. But other times it's hot, it's humid, it's sticky, and the person who's doing it doesn't do it right and they get a low threshold, but the actual test uh, compromised how many mites they actually found. If it's hot and sticky and you don't shake them right and the mites stay up in the sugar and they don't fall down and you go, oh, I only had two mites. So if you want to be careful about that, um, you know, do an alcohol wash every once in a while, switch it out. I figured if I did it every week, even if I did the sugar, which isn't as good, every week it's better than once a month. So yeah, I figured, you know, I could yeah, agree. see if it starts varying, I figured it would work. Yeah, if you're doing it every week, you're yeah. getting a sense. I mean, there's other ways to do this. Uh, Bob in the back always says this. And people used to look at bottom boards and count the mites. Don't do that. But you can look at a bottom board and get a sense of how many mites. Take a photograph with your phone and come back week after week after week. You'll see a noticeable gain visually. And you don't have to count anything. You go, okay, this hive seems to be in trouble. There's other things that happen in a hive atmosphere when the bees are sick. They're not as industrious. So look at your bees. You know, you don't see as much uh, opportunistic foraging and other things. You start seeing deformed wing virus if it gets bad. But there's other signs that you can see. So to, to that point, it, it all matters. Uh, there was one other question. Yeah. All right. There's you know, the advocating of the you know, treating in July and August. That would be a, the prime time for treating. And yet, if I remember correctly, Tim Schuler was advocating last year of holding off until September for treating. For yeah, so I'll hold that question and I'll talk about that. Okay. So, your statement, just for the record, is <coughs> Tim Schuler was saying make sure you look at treating in September. And maybe July and August wasn't the right time frame. Yeah. I'll, I'll come back to that. When I, when I went to EAS, they said try to treat at least three times a year. Yeah, and that's where I'm heading. The final answer is ding, 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 three times a year. <laughs> okay. August 1st, the reason I called this out is if you're going to get a nectar flow and you have treatments on, don't forget to take your stuff off in time. That's pretty easy to remember, right? Um, Apolite VAR, for example, has a 30-day wait period. And you, you really want to make sure that uh, whatever product you're using in, in your approach, that you leave the right window to, to put your, you know, that it would really suck if you got to a great nectar flow 
and you couldn't put your boxes on because you had a treatment in, right? You don't want to get in that situation. It's not good for the bees either, right? You need them to, to build their winter stores. So don't compromise your operation. Beekeeping is anticipation, not reaction. 15th to the 31st of August, monitor your mites. I would say this is another great time to check and I'm going where you are. August, September, October, this is when you should be actively monitoring your mites. You're making sure that whatever treatments you did ahead of time have been effective and you're also making sure that during the time period where fall comes and the nectar flow tapers off, sick hives start to die, things start to abscond, things in nature occur like feral hives and so on and you could be getting mite bombs from elsewhere. Okay, So you add your honey supers for goldenrod and asters but before you go stacking everything on top do your mite checks. Pull your honey supers October 1st and now you're heading towards that period of building your winter bees for the first frost, whenever that may be. It seems to get further and further in New Jersey, doesn't it? <laughs> Lately, if we get to December and it's like, hey, it's supposed to be cold. So pull your honey supers. Now the boxes are off. You could do your mite checks because you can get into the brood chamber. You treat as needed. And this is where you have options because it gets a little cooler in October time period. You don't have that temperature thing going on where it's crazy summer. You could use different products. So whatever you used, treatment one, treatment two, treatment three, you could vary it. Okay? So th there's, this is where you have to think about your year and have the product in your cabinet ready to go with whatever you're going to do if you need it. And I'm going to remind you that if this is your first treatment, <laughs> your hives are dead. <laughs> dead. Every year we get to beekeepers in our club who come to us and say, well, I haven't treated. What should I do? You could treat, but what I'm really saying to you is your hives are dead. Sorry. And they do die, and you have to start over again. Why would you invest all this energy all year long and ignore this? Don't wait until September and October to do your first treatment. Just don't do it. Your hives are dead. Do your fall preparations and monitor your mites. So now I'm going to come back to your question. In July and August when that peak is going and your hives are overwintering or getting ready for that period of fall, and I think you need to treat. I think you'd like to treat in the beginning of the year. Let me back that up sometime between March and the first nectar flow, you want to treat to keep the mite level low so that they aren't high when you're going through that summer. Then you get to summer where the bees start to taper off and the mites will overwhelm the hive, it's a good time to treat. However, when hives start to succumb, people who didn't treat and mite bombs and other things that go on, does anybody not know what a mite bomb is? A mite bomb is when a hive that your neighbor has or someone down the road, they didn't treat. Maybe they are treatment free, maybe they didn't get to it, who knows why. And their hive succumbs to mites. When a hive is overwhelmed by mite pressure, there are times when it will literally just leave, abscond. You know where it flies? Into your hive. <laughs> and it brings the mite load with it. So you, you get this overwhelm you're doing great all year long. You're monitoring, everything's great, and then all of a sudden in October your hives look terrible. Why? Because they got overwhelmed. I know Landy Simone talked about this about five years ago. We all thought it was strange. She had a treatment-free beekeeper, and I have nothing against treatment-free, although it's really difficult in New Jersey. She had a treatment-free beekeeper whose hives absconded and came and infested her yards. She literally had to move a yard away from where it was because of these pressures. So that's why Tim says September, October. He's not saying don't treat in July, but he's saying in September and October you have to be mindful of the possibility that your hive is going to get impacted by other hives. 
And go back to the first statement I said in the beginning is we're all connected, right? Our hives are all within flying distance across the entire matrix of the state except for certain pockets. You gotta have a plan. There's a Huey Lewis song on that. Keep notes of what worked, what didn't work, your thresholds throughout the year. Keep a running journal. Know what product you treated with so that you can figure out what not to treat with and do them multiple times in a row. I would uh, recommend you talk to your friends. Hey, I got this going on, what do you think I should be doing? You don't have to go it alone. There's a whole room full of beekeepers here. I've beat the instructions and follow the instructions. Think about the four things, right? Heat, temperature, what the brood is doing, whether there is brood or not, and so on. Okay, yeah? I just want to uh, confirm, you said that we, we can't, we have to always rotate the treatments. We can't just stick with half of our... Yeah, so let me talk about that. Next slide. Okay. Good timing. The question is, can you just stay with Apivar? Wish we could. Okay. Here's a sample plan. May or may not work. You may not have oxalic vaporizers. OAV is oxalic acid vaporization. Okay. Sample plan. In March, while the bees are out, but you don't want to break the hive apart, you stick this thing in the front entrance and you do a treatment. You zap all the mites that are on the bees when there's not a lot of brood. Okay, so that's not a bad idea in March. In April, you monitor, and if you have brood in the hive, and you want to do a quick treatment before the big bang, you can use formic acid, because it'll get the mites in the cells, and you'll set your hive up to be as healthy as possible through the best period of the year. Then in July, you monitor, and if need be, you do an app of our touch-up. You don't have any honey supers on. Good time period for that, yeah? And in October you monitor and if you find that you got some thresholds that are not conducive to where you want to be, maybe you do oxalic or you choose one of the other things. Hop guard, apigard, temperature sensitive. It's a good time period for the temperature ones, right? And in November I'm going to throw one more oxalic acid vaporization. Why November for this? Like Thanksgiving is a perfect time frame for little brood. Little brood, right? Because Queen's not making a lot of brood. She's getting ready to go to the cluster. She's not cranking out a lot of bees, which means any mites are phoretic and you zap whatever they're there. Now, the Queen does lay all year long. Even in the winter time, in December and January, when we're tucked in cozy to our beds, queens in there generating some new bees, and there are mites in there, but it's you know not a bad thing in November to do your touch up. You'll be healthier in the spring. So I'm going to go back to that question you asked me about: Can I use Apovar all the time? Oh, look, I got a little asterisk over there. Why can't I use Apovar in April and then use it again in July? It's too hot. You actually can. <laughs> you can. You're not supposed to, right? You're supposed to switch. But the theory of it is, if I used it in April and I used it in July, and then I came later and whacked those mites that were apovar resistant with something else, at least I killed them. But if I continue to use the same product over and over again, at some point I'm building super mites, and I don't want to do that. So, if it's convenient, I'm going to use that word very softly, if there's an option where I can't do anything, I'm not going to treat, but I could put Apivar in, put Apivar in, but make sure you write in blood that I'm going to come back later and do something so I don't breed super mites. Everybody good on that? So, I'll go, okay, every once in a while, a little sneaky, you could do it. Just make sure that you don't keep doing it over and over again and go, I'll get it next time. I'll pay the bill next time. Don't do that. Questions? What's the cost per hive? 
What is the cost per hive? Because last year we were talking about once and with the apple bar gets kind yeah. of expensive. You know, what's, times. I'll counter your question with a question, not to be mean, but Absolutely. what's a cost for a package <laughs> or, or a thing? So I, I know, we. I'll go back to I hate it. I, this is expensive. And be the last one to tell you I want to put any products in the hive. Um, I would recommend if you can do those brood breaks and things like that, call your drones. Maybe you can get away without treating. Um, splits do magic, honestly. So, uh, uh, what's half of our cost? $35 for 10. Yeah, it's like 35 bucks for 10 package. And, and on, they sell it in two or two and 10, right? That's what I remember. So, um, everybody should be getting their bee catalogs so you can go see what they cost. Yeah. And if you open the 10 pack, all of those have to be used? Every one of them has to be used. At that one time. So if I only have two hives, then I should buy two sets of two. And so find a neighbor in here and say, anybody want to split the cost? And that's how you kind of get your cost down, right? I think the manufacturer says like two weeks, one bar, two weeks, and, you, and it's sensitive to light more than, yeah. more than air. So what Mim said is you do have a little bit of a window when you crack the package open. You know, if you don't put them in for two weeks after you open it, but then you put it in, they'll still be effective for 56, but the clock is ticking when, when you open the package. And every one of these things says you should store them in a specific way. I'll take one more question. Uh, what about like a vacuum sealer? Or Doesn't work. That's no, on their site that says that's not an effective thing. So I'll be available during the break. We're going to take a quick break and then. We want to save some time for chip stalls and for Bob. So let's. Thanks, everybody. We're going to get something to eat, get a drink, we'll come back, we'll get to those presentations, have some more time for QA. Now we need a